Marketing Evolved podcast with Jason Peterson, Holly Peterson, and Deidre Stevens. During this time, we bring you some of the current marketing stories and, as always, offer up a bit of our unsolicited advice for small and medium-sized businesses specifically, based on our industry expertise and knowledge. Uh, so we're going to give you the format rundown. So for those unfamiliar with our podcast format, we'll give you a quick refresh. Each segment is time to make the best use of your time, topic, and to be and to prevent some of us from screwing down the rabbit hole of tangent land. So we will start with our topics of the week. Ready, everybody? Ready. Woo! So mine is an article from LinkedIn and it's called Please Keep Professional. LinkedIn is not Facebook. Let's create opportunity. And so this article talks about how um, for many of us, LinkedIn is the first place we turn on social media in our search for opportunity professional value and to build a solid professional network but lately it's starting to feel a little bit a little bit less professional and it goes on to talk about how this guy has noticed trolls on LinkedIn and it's just he's not happy about it and then that's because trolls live everywhere this is true and so he challenges at the very end of the article he challenges people to say let's create content make comments and communicate in a way that is truly powers our career, add value to other professionals, is preferable, not offensive, and rather mindful of the rights and opinions of others that is respectful of their worth, work, time, and effort. Let's create dialogue on LinkedIn that's supportive, inclusive, and that creates value for others. So to Holly and Jason, is LinkedIn becoming less professional and more like Facebook? How so? Go ahead, Jason. All right. <clears throat> so I would say, I don't know. I mean, we've talked about how I think LinkedIn in the past was just a resume site. So for me, I didn't see a lot of value for our clients. Um, I haven't noticed as much of that. Now, I will admit that I'm not like following the feed all the time of people that post on it. So I'm not shocked. Every social media um, ecosystem has weirdos, trolls that do stuff. So um I don't know. I, I, I haven't noticed that, but I do see uh, where there's going to be some more weirdos and crazies dealing so with LinkedIn. every time you put yourself out there, you're putting yourself out there. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. that would be true if you were like a newscaster. And that's true for even this podcast. I mean, there's opportunity for trolls around every bend and every corner and in every bridge. So, like, I, why would LinkedIn be any exception, you know? It's, it's happening on Facebook, it's happening on, you know, Instagram, it happens on Twitter. I mean, trolls abound, and people just wait for opportunities like that, so. I know, it's just unfortunate, because, I mean, when I think of LinkedIn, I do think of a professional platform. Sure. Like, I'm not just connecting with, you know, my family and friends. I'm connecting with potential yeah. clients or mentors or just business professionals, and I at some point, we got to keep professionalism to a higher standard. And I know that's hard in today's world, but that's why I, I am sad to see. I've definitely noticed this trend that he's talking about, not as aggressive. And he and this article, I've shared it on my personal LinkedIn. You can read more about it. He dives into, we will use it as like a dating platform and things like that. Yeah. So I just, it, it comes down to probably a cultural thought of like, we don't really keep professional professionalism high anymore. Yeah. Um, but that's true across the board, oh, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. no, hundred uh, percent. Um, it's not that I agree with trolls on any platform for that matter, but it it's not a shocker to me that people are now starting to see that leak over into the LinkedIn, which, like you said, is supposed to be this professional networking platform. Unfortunate, but true. Yeah, I I don't know. It was a really good read. I encourage everyone to to check it out because it got me thinking of like what am I you know I don't really pose on LinkedIn all that often it was my goal in the 2019 to do be a little bit more active on there but spread positive like generate news or just small business news Mm -hmm. I try to be more prevalent in that aspect sure not not tearing people down yep that's what that's to me what Twitter or Facebook is for (laughs) <laughs> like to tear, yeah, I that's just to tear, tear people, people down. down if I'm going to troll somebody about The Bachelor it's going to be on Twitter but sorry it's, not sorry it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because um, and some people care about this a lot some people don't care about it at all but um, basically 
the royal family had put out that statement about Kate and Meghan and about basically saying the same thing. It's like, you know, we're trying to serve the people here. We're trying to do good. Can we try to keep some of the criticism and the trolling and essentially the bullying um, off of our official pages? And, you know, obviously that's a very, um, for back of, lack of a better way of saying it, I mean, that's a very noble thing to say. And, you know, that's a nice desire to have. Is it realistic? Probably not, unfortunately. I mean, they're very public figures and people like to tear other people down. And that's just really too bad. But yeah, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, I yeah. To me, I think it's we talk about the power for good and the power for bad. It's not that we all love social media. It's just that we try to be in the places where our clients are having conversations. There's parts of it I enjoy, but clearly there's the other part of it that is quite annoying and not very constructive. And with that, where'd it go? I'm looking so for much my for bell. That bell. No, here we go. <laughs> there it is. Okay, that's all right, Jason, Jason. It's go your turn. For it. Okay. All right. So my take was I wanted to talk a little bit about, and, and part of this is tech, but it influences us a great deal from a content creation and from a web development perspective. And that is um, the new foldable phone stuff. So um, right now they just had this big international mobile conference. Uh, Huawei came out with an amazing one. That's the one that looks like it says Huawei, but it's actually Huawei. It's a Chinese company. Um, Samsung came out with one, um, they found re just recently some crazy patents on, on the Apple's end that's proving that this is a real thing. Um, again, I, there's always with everything. And I know when I've been on Jack Mitchell's show, we talk a lot about leading and bleeding edge. And right now this is on the bleeding edge where the technology is way ahead of itself. It's clunky. I think the Samsung foldable phone, which basically takes like a, uh, like a eight plus kind of size and then it basically just folded in half but it has continuation screens there's like six cameras on it it's just it makes your brain hurt to actually try to understand how it works plus you're folding physically a screen on a phone so um first thing i would say is this is i probably one of the first times in a long time right in the last 10 years that you're going to probably see some disruption in terms of possible innovation in which how people utilize mobile handheld technology. Now, I think from a marketing perspective, this just continues to reinforce the fact that um, it is extremely difficult and pretty much every website that's built has to be built in a very fluid, and the term is responsive nature. And that is constantly evolving. And what I saw in the demonstration of the Samsung one was how, I think they used Facebook where it was like, you could see it on the front and then it like, as a continuation into the inside. It was totally wacky. Um, so to me, interface design and ultimately how we deliver content uh, to our clients and, you know, for our clients trying to get in front of their clients, um, that's a moving target. That's tough. So I think this is one of those things we're going to keep our eye on right now. I mean, like I said, it's like 2000 bucks for the Samsung one. Nobody's going to do anything. But yeah, so there's there's the trend I would say be watching for. Thoughts? Anybody have any thoughts on that? I mean, I'm personally still just trying to comprehend, like, the Alexas and the Google Homes. Like, these home assist things, I'm still trying to really wrap my head around that. Like, the fact that I could tell a machine, hey, add this to my grocery list, and potentially then it's shipped to my house. Or, like, mm -hmm. Google to put something on my TV, and then it's connected to my thermostat. Or, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that technology and AI and all that. I'm not ready for foldable, like a foldable phone. Like well, I'm not, I'm not to that level. I don't, I don't get why. So that's my question. <laughs> is, um, Jason, maybe you can help us understand yes. why I need a foldable why? phone. Well, okay. It's so seven years ago. Why did you need an Apple watch? You didn't, but what happened? I still don't need an Apple watch. I, I realize this, <laughs> but it, if there's anything I've learned is initially I make fun of something. And inevitably, in most cases, well, it's just the these it. trends somehow kind of leak in and we don't expect them to become standardized, but then they do. And so, but what Apple does better than anybody else is they take stuff that's existing, whether it's a smartphone, whether it's the smartwatch, whether it's the iPod, and they 
fix the issues that make it seem clunky with everybody else? I mean, okay. So if I'm like a scientist or a surveyor, or I'm like working literally out in the field and, you know, I needed some sort of tech that I could literally fold out maybe like a map even or, or something like that. And then when I'm not using it, fold it back up. But like for what they're showing us now, some of these models that they're showing, I mean, they're only talking about taking something like this and folding it like once or once. I'm yeah. like, what's what I mean, I mean, to me, what that? it is, is it's probably trying to blur the lines where you actually can benefit from a tablet use and a phone use at the same time. That that would be my like, I think a lot of people. That's what this is for. Which is. I agree. No, but I wish a lot of you. I think there is this need for people that want to have like their iPad as their phone. Mm -hmm. And right. that's not really a capability yet. And so I think with these foldable phones, that's the first step of them. Because, I mean, I have the X Max or whatever, and that's the biggest screen, mm -hmm. you know, and but that's still not big enough for some people. I mean, yeah. they want it, they want it all, basically. So, yeah, I think that's what this technology is leaning towards. But I'm still one step at a time, people. One step at a time. Yep. So just watch for it. <laughs> there you go. All right. I'll go for it. My topic. So, okay. So my topic is actually something that we've been talking about at Generate for off and on for, I don't know, a couple of years, as maybe we've had some friends and family that have passed away, unfortunately, and just how that relates to social media. Because the last couple of years, as some of these individuals have passed away, I have had notifications come up about those people's birthdays. Wish them a happy birthday. And like, it just creates this sort of awkward personal moment inside or for some people like really evokes horrible bad feelings like just oh my gosh I can't believe this is on here and then it just it's this rush of emotion so there are so many questions out there about okay when someone does pass away because it is inevitable you know um what happens to their social media what happens to their social media feed what happens to their email what happens to all of these assets and let's face it our lives for most people who are on social are on those feeds. Um, I think about the documentation we have of our family, like our children, because right. we are obviously on social before our children were born. Um, and like just all of that. And what happens to all of that information once that person has passed? And actually, as I've been doing research on it's kind of staggering how ill prepared a lot of these feeds are for this. In fact, I have a few stats here I'll just read through briefly. Um, how long until my account is deactivated? And this was an article that Mashable, Mashable did. Um, Facebook, it says, until memorialized or reported. So as we've seen, unless it's memorialized or reported, never. never. That's right. Twitter, six months. But again, that just must acquire be inactivity? I don't really know exactly. Mm -hmm. Pinterest, never. Never happens. It's always there. Um, LinkedIn, until reported. Most people aren't going to report that, especially LinkedIn. Uh, Google, nine months until reported or until the time you previously set with the inactive account manager. And the thing that's crazy to me is they actually require death certificates, proof, and your ties to that individual. So you have to be an immediate family member and you have to jump through all these hoops. What? Yeah, super raw. Who's going to do that? Who's going to do that? Right? Yeah, this is a mess. I think this is a great topic. So there's there's the lowdown. I this is going to make me probably sound, I mean, granted, I'm the, the young millennial here, but I, gosh, they're going to have to like put that in people's wills now. Like, uh, like Agreed. a proper, that like, is correct. because you're right. Like an email almost is an asset. Really. You house so much information that that is an asset and any smart lawyer, if there's a lawyer listening, I would just incorporate that into a will of like, I'm sure it is. Just ours like, actually I, has a clause about Facebook in our will. I'm I'm sure. But like, my thing would be like the passwords and stuff. Yeah, that, anything I mean, in the cloud. Yeah, yeah like, it's, you a, know, it's and, a mess. And I know probably with some people, I could probably like find a way to figure it out. But that's not the thing that stinks. And this is the ultimately the world we live in. You know, I think of like when I've gone through like a bad breakup or something, or a friend you didn't get along with. Like the last thing you want to do is face them, not only in person but on social media. Mm -hmm. That's like the same, same. So when someone passes. The last thing you want to do 
is take care of that and as as exactly as important as like it is like we just discussed it's a hard pill to swallow to have to be like Oh, I'm gonna take them on Facebook because that's and like, then to jump through the hoops that are required. Yes. It's like yeah. who's really gonna do and that? And see what people are not doing is they're not really doing anything. So I have a lot of deceased friends on my Facebook, tons. I probably have 15, and some of it is the family has to decide. But like you're saying, it's not just Facebook; but, it's the digital footprint as a whole that's left. Well, and can I be like a devil's advocate here for a minute? Do you mean for some people though that's like a good mechanism of grieving of like having it their be. It, it can having be having yes. their digital identity there like well but that's one of the steps is memorializing it so you can change it to become so, a memorial versus yes, an active and it friend it says that it says that like when you go onto the page well, it is understood and acknowledged that this person has passed jeez and well i can't imagine so facebook does not pictures. have a good because what they're doing is if no, they don't they do yeah they're not. terrible <laughs> no. so what they end up doing is you keep getting suggestions you keep getting reminders like they are alive so that becomes it becomes even more awkward so yes it's well documented we all know facebook you cannot get any help on anything but no i i mean it's it's the technology is ahead of the utilitarian need to how do you just deal with the natural challenges of somebody passing away and well, it's complicated and that's one of the crazy things about this too they said that they were talking about the stats of essentially like when it says okay if facebook stops growing and that's a facebook stops growing right um if they keep growing so the crossover so basically living users versus deceased users deceased users will cross over to the living users by 2065 because they aren't deleting these accounts. They're not getting rid of these profiles. They're not memorializing most of them. And then it says if Facebook keeps growing, it'll be not until like 2030. That's the pace they're growing at. I'm going to go with that. Like, I have a firm belief that as this generation starts taking care of their parents, mm -hmm. like as you guys start taking care of your, it's going to probably be on the forefront of your mind yeah. more than it has years past. I agree. This is the still, boomers. Yeah, 10, and Facebook's still only 10, 15, 11 years old, yeah, whatever. the more the tech ages and time Yeah, the, it's right. the boomers yeah. are passing away, and that's the ones I've noticed recently um, sorry, where, boomers. yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> but, you know, again, they're, it's the grandparent age of the ones that have actually been a significant user of Facebook, and they're the ones that, as they age, obviously, they're going to be passing away. So, I mean, on our end, clearly, we'll pass on advice and knowledge and stuff on this, because I think it is. It's a very you know, mm -hmm. practical thing to understand of how to navigate. it's a very sensitive subject. Absolutely. Okay, obviously. We have talked that, but there is more to say, and I have a feeling that will come up again moving For sure. forward at some point, too, especially as the tech, begin, you know, continues to evolve and change, so. All right. All right. Listener questions. We have two listener questions today, All which right. is very exciting. First, we have a Tom the Dobbins. Tom Dobbins. Tom, Tom, Tom Dobbins. Dobbins. He would like to know, discuss, discuss practical, practical steps of VPN for home usage. This would be a Jason, yes. All right. Jason. Jason. question. Okay, so let me first define what this is in layman terms. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. Now, in most cases, people more or less have something like this. Because if you have like, say, a, uh, a Linksys Wi-Fi router at your house and you have your little Wi-Fi and you have a password and stuff, your little network, that essentially is a virtual, that is a private network. Now, when you get into where you're in a corporate environment where you're like, say, in multiple locations and then you're having to create this sort of place networking wise where you can share stuff and it's connected across city to city that's when a vpn is more of a practical approach now there's all kinds of techie stuff we can go into the weeds about and as many know that's what my dad does um so for me probably the best answer and of course tom being my uh father-in-law i'll explain to him <laughs> that it's probably better to have a good wi-fi secure setup in terms of localized use for in defense of a, a VPN, it really is not as much necessary for consumer as it is more beneficial for business and large ones at that. There you go. Okay, I have nothing well, to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> and done. Yeah. Um, before I read our last question, uh, for everyone listening and for those on Facebook Live, uh, you can always ask us questions. You can um, comment on our stuff on Facebook, Generate Marketing, or on Instagram, Generate Lincoln. Texas. Texas, email us, give me a call, 
Call However me. you want to beat me if you want to reach me. All right. Do you guys know what that's from? No. I don't. <laughs> that's Kim Possible. Oh. Nice. <laughs> All right. That was my age for a minute. All right. The last question is from Chris Thaler um, from My Coaching Dimensions, and she wants to know what the biggest challenge that small business owners have. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. You want to take that, Holly? Time, time. Not on our side. No. <laughs> it's just really not. Um, yeah. I mean, my answer for sure is time. And maybe I'm saying that as a mom. Maybe I'm saying that as a business owner. Um, I don't, yeah. Time. Time is very difficult. So it's, it's always a kind of a constant juggling act. And um, then you have to weigh, I have 5,000 things on my plate. 500 of those are important. Which 500 am I going to address? And then on top of that, how much time am I going to spend on each one? So I know, and I had to deal with this initially, especially in marketing. Like I am one of those people that likes to have a clean desk by the end of the day and do the done and dusted, <laughs> as my friends in England like to say. Um, but that really just doesn't happen. Yeah, it doesn't happen. What, so. what would you say for small business owners listening, you know, where you struggle with time? obviously every single day, but what is your your one piece of advice of time management? Like, time management. how do you keep it sane? Well, I would say kind of going back to what I was talking about, prioritizing, because mm -hmm. you're always going to have hot things. You're always going to have things that suddenly drop in front of you on your plate, and it's like a hair on fire kind of situation. But you know what? You still have to ask yourself at the end of the day, is that your hair on fire, or is that someone else's hair on fire? Is that, is there... Is, does their emergency constitute your emergency? Yep. So there's that that goes on. Um, but then you also have to say, it's probably going to make sense that if I build some traction a little bit with this hot thing, then I need to move on and build some traction with the next hot thing. So that by the time, you know, I cir circle around in two to three days, um, is it, they're going to get done, you know, and then I can actually officially say, okay, let's move on to the next set of priorities. And to be honest with you, I'm going to get a little plug to base camp. Just Basecamp is what we use at Generate, and it has helped immensely because there are things that I can put hair on fire dates on and say this has to be done and set those hard limits because I'm a checklist person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then there are also the things I can have floating in there going, yeah, this isn't a priority, but I can work on this, you know, at the end of the day for 10 minutes and feel good about it, you know. Yeah. So that's kind of where I stand. So many of you know, I've basically been an owner pretty much my whole adult life, and this is what I tell, and you know, we get to the opportunity and we enjoy helping small businesses, some that are existing and some that are startups. Uh, the bottom line is the odds are stacked against you. I mean, essentially, what is it? 95% fail in five years. That's a stat that I've heard many times. So the point is, it's what do you, what does the 5% do to get past that hump? Mm -hmm. I think like Holly said, is it's being intentional. And a lot of that is about what you spend your time on. You're going to be challenged and pulled in 50 different directions. And frankly, for us, I mean, we're going on our ninth year and it's still tough. I mean, we are a family business. Some would argue even tougher now. It is. I mean, we've got kids and we've got Deidre and we have people and that we care about as our team and mouths to feed and clients to make happy. And I think at the end of the day, it is about trying to truly discern what is has to be done that day and what are things that, you know, again, I think stress-wise, what can you control and what can you not? Um, you know, I, I look at the number side of things. I know initially I didn't know anything about business finance and I learned the hard way through just challenges and difficulties, but no, I, I think as a small business owner right now, it is truly standing out, being intentional and in what makes you unique and then executing on those, you know, things that have to be done to be successful. I mean, I think also for us, we know with our clients that, hey, if you don't get sales, you're not in business. I mean, that's the number one thing. So I think for us, philosophically, we feel that marketing is only effective if we're actually helping you get sales. Um, but it's tough. I mean, it's tough. Now, again, I think I would also argue it's one of some of the most rewarding stuff we've ever been able to do as far as I know for us, it's about our kids and we get a decide and build a team and flexibility flexibility and stuff so um but i know for us like you know unless you say i'm gonna go on vacation yeah you'll never go you, you literally pencil it in i mean you have to count and we've just that. finally started doing that in the last two years now, some of us is that you know financially you get to a point where okay you know you can actually like 
take a break for a week and be able to keep things going on. But, but you're never unplugged. No, you're never <laughs> truly unplugged. Um, yeah, can you still get a hold of me? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you can. Keep you on can. The trail. <laughs> but it is, I. it's a great question. I mean, that's probably a 30 minute conversation, but that's my. Yeah. Small Deidre, what's your take? Uh, well, I, I thought about this question long and hard, and I know I kind of talked about this with Holly um, a little bit before, and I my biggest thing is kind of like what Jason touched on a little bit, is just staying on top of everything outside of your business. And what I mean by that is just constantly evolving. You know, you're going to always have competitors. Some may be stronger than others. But, you know, like I know for us, like doing this podcast, it gives us a chance to research what's actually going on. It is. That's what I see what I just did there. <laughs> bada bing, bada boom. Our tagline in action. Plug. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, like, you know, I, you know, personally for myself, I try to spend at least an hour a day. Now that does not happen. 30 minutes maybe. And I just read the local news or yep. I read the tech news or Me I, too. I try to, because there's so much going on and, yep. and things could just fly by, but you know, as a small business owner, you get so consumed in, in what you're doing that I think sometimes the world around you continues to evolve yeah. and then it kind of hits you in the face one day. And then that's when we have clients that come to us and they're like, Hey, we need to solve this problem. And it's like, Whoa, you're just now realizing this problem now? This problem was six months ago. That's right. Yeah. But when you know when you're an owner, you have I I get it. You like Jason Holly both said you got time and lives and so those things seem small and then become big. I understand that. Um but I think that's important not to plug us, but that's why you have a good marketing team watching that for you. That's always. Right. That's right. Um but you know it's it's tough. I, I, I completely I applaud you guys for doing it and hiring me because I don't, you know, I don't, and you got to, I think this is the final thing too. <laughs> we you. are very, very blessed. Um, I think the other thing is you got to have drive. And what I mean by that yes. is not only like the drive to make money, but the drive to personally succeed. Like you guys want to leave behind a good legacy for Trevor and Lydia. Lydia, like that's just what you guys want to do. But you don't want them to be like, oh, mom and dad weren't like focused on the money. Like you don't want that. You no, want them to know. Not at all. <laughs> no, yeah. it's it's yeah. no. Can... So it, so have the right kind of drive. Now I'm not gonna say that there probably were times that you both were like, hey, we need to do what we need to do to pay the mortgage. I'm I'm sure. Yeah. But you got to balance that drive. Otherwise, you just become greedy and money no, hungry I... and just. Bad. Yeah, no, bad. you, you, you yeah. can't yeah. just focus if, if it's just yeah. about money. I mean, I think there's no question that, I mean, we joke about work ethic, but you have to be willing to a be taller. You have to tolerate risk. I mean, it's basically you have to be willing to admit when you fail, fall flat in your face and be able to get back up if you do fail. And I think for a lot of people, they think being an owner is easy in that regard. And it is anything but not. Um like, I, I think that's why we like talking with owners, because I can talk to them and say, yeah, you know what it's like not to be able to be payroll. And they're like, yep. And it, that's kind of the owner's code, I call it, because we've all had plenty and we've all had not enough. Mm -hmm. And I think the mature owners know that you don't get too high or too low. You kind of do as steady as you go. it never really goes away. No. I mean, let's face it. Our economy is just volatile enough, is. if not yep. really volatile at times, that you can have an amazing year and you can have a horrible year and the fluctuation even even in a couple of months you know is just it's like heartburn oh I mean, I... we go through a lot of tums in our <laughs> yes we do <laughs> so yeah so yeah that's a great con i we could do a whole other yeah great great question chris all right well and this is one of my favorite talks is the question of the day where we talk about a couple of things we for got two today don't we 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 do have two today. Thanks, Holly, for including two. <laughs> I was I just crossed it out because I think let's have time for one. No, we're gonna do okay. Um so the first one I was inspired. I have time. to make a RIP to Luke Perry, mm -hmm. the nine one two one oh Riverdale star. And you know, he was a very uh heart heart throb and so it got me thinking, I wanted to ask, who was your celebrity crush growing up? Who was the poster on your wall, the one that just made you melt? My sister and I. We're just talking about this last night because Rip Luke Perry, mm -hmm. he, I literally had a Humondo <laughs> poster above my bunk bed wall. And you know, what's, what's so funny about when I put that poster out, number one, my mom, 
<laughs> um, you know, moms can't ever picture their daughter getting to that age where they're like, mm, dreamy. Um, <laughs> but the minute the minute I hung it up and we let our dog Snooky in, he ran in the room, saw it, like it, to him probably looked like some dude sitting on my bunk bed, and he started barking his brains out about it. And um, so that was like, wow, I guess that really is my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and Snooky was a little he dog. Seriously, was in fact. I remember sitting with uh, my sister Cassie and my friend Annie in our bedroom, um, and we wrote letters to Luke mm. Perry was mine that I wrote the letter to, nice. and Jason Priestley, and I remember reading an article in, like, whatever, Kids Beat or whatever it's called, <laughs> and Tiger. he was talking about how he had this exotic Tiger pet as a, a pot-bellied pig. I'm like, ooh, hold on, I gotta get this out. That's fine, go and ahead. I was like, I gotta think of something cool that's gonna like attract his attention in my lab. And so I told him I had a pet parent named Jamaica. <laughs> was wow. that true? No. But yes, Luke Perry him? impacted my junior high teen life exponentially mm. at that time. Okay, I'll do mine quick. Yeah. So mine was a little later. It's funny. Yeah. Yukon would have never allowed a picture of a of a girl in my, in my room. That just wasn't going to fly. If anybody knows my mother, and God bless her, she's awesome. So, but as I got older, I would say Jennifer Aniston was my over the top. I I was a smitten kitten about her, and some may like, uh, but no, I did. I as I must admit, she was she well, was my okay. heart. I, and Deidre, obviously, <laughs> you're you're mirroring my sentiment here. What was the thing with Jennifer Aniston? Is it Friends? Help Jennifer me Aniston? understand. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was Friends. It, I'm not talking about later on. I'm talking about okay. like I can, just was it she had a, it was it was the <laughs> hair. It was she had kind of that sassy but like smart aleck kind of personality. I'll, and I'm I'll speaking to Friends. The Friends, Jennifer Aniston. Anything after nah, that? like yeah. the Avino commercial? No, uh-huh. I'm not, out. No, no, we're we're talking mid nineties, ninety four maybe. Okay. That's to me my, but you know, like, I mean, again, I'd so have been. Her, so were you David Schwimmer? No, <laughs> I don't know. That's is that, a good question. Is that Rod? He was pretty I lame. <laughs> <laughs> Although I did, it, he was a very amusing character. I will admit that. But no, like that that was probably Always mine. admired from afar. Admired from afar. But I did not write any letters to where I will oh, admit. Yeah, I did not do anything in that. Um you I believe sit in your room with your friends listening to cocktail soundtrack <laughs> writing letters. Wow. That's a good oh, soundtrack man. too. Ooh, little memory lane there. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> no, I'm gonna one up you. You gotta listen to Okay, if so you're now you go to for any it. Tom Cruise movie album you're gonna listen to top gun i'm sorry oh good grief yeah, yes that classic we used to play like that we'd play okay. sand volleyball to it actually it's oh cheesy God. that's not that's a total <laughs> truth oh, when we played sand how volleyball much, in college they would always you have on your body at that time my yeah. goodness that was back when they didn't put any sunscreen. we didn't put any sunscreen no, i was they just a, put the oil i was just a brown bear <laughs> <laughs> yes got the snort i know <laughs> All right. Okay, Deidre. Deidre, well, you, I'm and then we got to wrap hear, it up. Well, I had to hear. I had to think about this long and hard because I had two of them technically, but I'll just do the one because this is definitely. I mean, Justin Bieber, the swish hair. I was front row to his concert in 2009, and oh. I touched his hand and I fainted. Like I literally, Whoa. like you literally, I, and I yeah, well Whoa. yeah, and then I also got to ask him a question because I had like backstage passes, and I like got to ask him. I got to ask him what his position he played was in hockey. He did the whole like hair flip around, and he's like, "I was a forward." And I was like, "Oh, oh yeah." Of course you. Were. I I had like I literally had the future <laughs> Mrs. Bieber shirt. I uh, went out with my allowance and bought these high top sneakers just like he had. I I'm a believer <laughs> from now in the rest. Uh-huh. I that was that was the guy. That That's transformative. I, yeah, it was. Clearly. It was. That's oh, pretty sweet. That was like the oh I I get emotional because I was very. Like his album, My World 2.0, came out with Baby and all that. And I just would remember singing it out loud and crying. Like, I loved it so much. And everyone was yelling at him. It was an emotional experience every time. It was. It was. Close second is Zach Efron, though. Yeah, he's pretty hot. Yeah, he's pretty hot. High school <laughs> musical. High school Man music- crush. High school Man musical crush. Zach Efron, though. I That's know, when Greatest I- showman. He was pretty. Yeah, he's pretty sweet. Like a yeah. historical Zach yeah. Efron. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he went from that to what his latest role is going to be in Ted Bundy. So it really evolved. We'll Look at that. that. Wow. Yeah. All right. What is our final thought? 
Um, how about a special thank you to our guest today, Jilly. Um, not sure if you heard any of her moans in the background, which she is famous for, but we'd like to thank Jilly for being with us today in oh, the studio. And happy Fat Tuesday, everybody. Mardi Gras is today. Woohoo! So, wow. Yeah, so tomorrow, be thinking about if you do practice Ash Wednesday, what you're going to give up or what you're going to do. Think of that over the next 40 days before the Easter Bunny comes and knocks on your door. I'm still dreaming of snow melt. Oh <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, happy Fat Tuesday. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank How you. about a throw out on our handle, Deidre? You can follow us on Facebook, Generate Marketing, and that's G E N capital R eight, like the number eight marketing. And then Instagram is Generate Lincoln. Same thing with Twitter. Yep. And then you can also follow us on our personal platforms as well. I'm at Miss Deidre, Jason and Holly. <laughs> uh, Jason or, Jason Lyle is mine. Yep. Or email us directly at info at generatemarketing.com. Yep. Thank Thanks you, everybody. For everybody. Thank you, everybody.